Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent, and this week's episode is sponsored by my book, Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. Uh, this is the story of an 11-year-old biracial detective and his cousin, Ellicott Skullworth, uh, as they embark on an exciting adventure to save Latimer City from giant robot bees. Uh, once you are completely immersed in the world of the story, make sure you come back for the sequel, Banneker Bones and the Alligator People. Uh, if you like books about uh, animal uh, creatures uh, that are maybe a little bit scary, uh, you will like the Alligator People. Uh, and I'm assuming you like that because we're going to be talking about a similar book today. Uh, if you're curious, uh, check out uh, both books, but uh, are available as uh, both are available as paperbacks and ebooks. Uh, Benica Bones and the Giant Robot Bees is available as an audiobook narrated by the exquisite David Radke. So if you're saying, Rob, I listen to your podcast, but I can't imagine the thought of listening to you read a book to me. Fear not. I got somebody way better and more talented than I am to read the audiobook. Uh, and the ebook is free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. So download Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees for free. When you're hooked on the series, come see me with money for the sequel and the upcoming third book that will be available uh, sometime next year. Uh, if you prefer uh, scarier books under the super secret pen name Robert Kent. I've written some titles for older readers, such as All Together Now, A Zombie Story, uh, which is a young adult horror story featuring, you guessed it, zombies. Um, so if you've always been curious about what the zombie apocalypse would look like in Indiana, I promise you it involves a Walmart and a church and a whole bunch of other great stuff, plus a cornfield. Rest assured, I've covered it all. So check out All Together Now, a zombie story, and stick around for All Right Now, a short zombie story. Or if you really, really want to go full-on adult horror, uh, check out The Book of David, which is a five-volume serial horror novel about an atheist that buys a haunted house that then begins to give him religious visions involving flying saucers. It is as bonkers as it sounds, and it just gets crazier each chapter that you go through. Uh, so it's five books long. I'm calling them chapters, although the fifth book is the longest book I've written. The first book, The Book of David, Chapter One by Robert Kent, is available to download as an ebook for free whenever you're listening to this. Check it out. Get hooked. Come see me for chapters two, three, four, and five. It'll be a good time. Uh, coming up on the show, we've got several great guests planned. If you want to know who's coming, uh, I know next Saturday we'll have an amazing guest. Um, and the Saturday after that, but I'm never sure exactly who is going to appear until we get everything recorded. Um, so you can keep track of the show and what's going on at middlegradedenture.com. Uh, you can also read hundreds of interviews with publishing professionals, authors, uh, editors, literary agents, folks you want to read interviews with. And it's all available for free at middlegradedenture.com. Uh, today, I couldn't be more excited. Uh, my guest is Mira Bartok, author of The Wonderling. Mira, how are you this evening? I'm great. I'm, doing, I'm just sitting here thinking, how do you have time to write all those books when you have kids? I, I write them badly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. That's, that's quite a list. Oh, my gosh. Well, it's, uh, I've been writing for a very long time. Um, but I've been publishing books actively for uh, five years now, uh, and I am usually good for about a book and a half to two books a year. Wow. I'm slow. <laughs> Very slow. But that's that's pretty amazing. Oh, well, but it's well not uh, quantity, it's quality. <laughs> I hold up my copy of The Wonderling for those of you listening. This is an extremely quality book and a long book. This this might be two chapters, maybe even three of the Book of David. This is a, <laughs> this is a now. Once you get started, you are going to be completely immersed for a time. Um, so, well, why don't we start with the Wonderling? Why not? Let's just get right to it. Okay. Uh, if you would uh, give, uh, a, I'm terrible about summarizing other people's so, uh, biographies I, I, and other people's so. books. So if I summarize your, uh, an author's book, sometimes it'll turn to me and say, did you read my book? That's not what it's about at all. <laughs> so since I have you here, rather than you listening to me talk about it, uh, go ahead and give esteemed audience kind of uh, the premise of The Wonderling. Uh, I'm terrible 
uh, summarize in my own books too, but uh, I'll try. Um, so my book is set in a kind of steampunk Dickensian world. Um, I would say steampunk light. Um, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's about this character who is, um, his name is number 13 in the beginning. He doesn't know his name. He doesn't know where he came from. And he's living in this terrible, terrible orphanage called Miss Carbuncle's home for wayward and misbegotten creatures. And um, he's bullied. He, he's, uh, other, uh, he's a groundling, which is a, a, an animal-human hybrid, hybrid, which is sort of lowest on the totem pole in his world. Um, humans are at the top, and he's at the bottom, and they're treated really, um, groundlings are treated terribly. But he ends up making a friend, this little bird named Trinket, a bird groundling, and they escape the orphanage. Um, and then they set off on adventures. I won't go into detail because um, I don't want to give anything away, but um, adventures ensue, trouble, trouble ensues. And um, along the way, my character's given a name and he has a real name and he has a quest to, um, to do. And uh, he also has a very, very special gift um, that... Uh, pretty much saves his life and saves the life of others um and that gift becomes more important in book two so i don't know if that uh, is an awful summary <laughs> if you can add anything <laughs> well i'm uh, making a mental note that we should call him number 13 and, and not spoil the his actual name is that right you know i think that you know what i think that um in a lot of uh a lot of re most reviews he you do get his name so yes he 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 we can say his name is arthur and it's he gets that name because he does he he steps up to the plate and performs an act of bravery that is um he's normally he's a very very shy stuttering sort of creature and so um his his friend his new friend names him for you know the great um mythical or non-mythical king arthur so there are various arthurian tropes throughout um the series um, that if you're an Arthurian geek, you'll pick some up. <laughs> and if you're not, doesn't matter. It, it's fine. You'll so. become an Arthur, Arthurian geek uh, after you read this book. You you might, like, you oh, my gosh, I got to know more about King Arthur. Yes. To the library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I had read that you had modeled Arthur on Sadie, your dog. Is that right? Um, well, at first, at f the very first drawing of my character was a one-eared rabbit, and then I stared at for at, at it for a while because I a lot of my characters start out as drawings, and um, and then I realized, oh, that looks just like Matt Grinning's uh, Life in Hell bunny um, from his comic series. So I thought I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get sued, <laughs> and so and so uh, I just was trying to think. I knew I wanted my character to have one one ear. Um, I, I really like a lot of sort of old folk tales, fairy tales, where a character has a lack and, but also a gain. Um, in this case, you know, he has a special gift, um, where he can hear things from miles away and he has a special musical gift that he doesn't really realize until much later. Um, so I was, I was just sitting there feeling bad about, my failure with this one-eared bunny. And then I looked at my dog who has gigantic, she recently passed away, but she had gigantic uh, pointy ears. She looks, she looked like a, a little black fox. And then that, that was it. I wanted, I wanted uh, my character to look a little like her, sort of a cross between a fox and a dog. So. I'm sorry to hear about uh, Sadie. Yeah, I loved her. She, she's, She's still in my heart, so um, and I still draw pictures of her. So, and a version of her will now live on for readers yes. to encounter and enjoy yeah. uh, in perpetuity, right? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> She's achieved a kind of, of immortality, almost. <laughs> yes, she has, definitely. And I, I'm shocked to hear you say that this started off as the life is hell bunny because I can't even imagine that version of Arthur. This must have been a long transition. So well, actually, if I really, if I really go back, I, I recently found an old sketchbook um, 
where I had this tiny, tiny little drawing of this weird little creature. I don't know what it was. And, and it had one ear and it just had a little comic bubble, um, thought bubble that said, hello, my name is one ear. <laughs> and that was it. I think I had this obsession with a one ear creature for a long time and I have no idea why. And then it, that morphed into the life is hell, life, life in hell rabbit. So. Do you, um, do you often find you're obsessed about things without knowing the exact reason? Because I do. Oh, yeah. And it, it can be problematic, Rob, because, um, like, I, 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 I dropped in all these hints and all these images in book one. Um, here, here's advice to writers <laughs> writing a series. Um, know what those are going to be by the time you, before you publish that book. Because when I, when, you know, came down to sitting down and writing book two, I'm like, why in the world did I put that in there? I better come up with a reason. I just kept seeing this image. I'm very image driven. And I just, you know, for instance, these cats, there are cats everywhere. Um, the, my, the rich people in town are obsessed with cats and they walk cats with these diamond collars. And I wasn't sure why I just saw these characters with these high white hats, little birds on, attached to them on golden chains, and they're walking these cats with diamond collars. No idea why. Well, now I know. I've worked it out. Um, but it would have been a lot easier if I had, you know, pulled a J.K. Rowling and, like, spent five years plotting out seven books, which is what she did, um, you know. Um, so it, it's good to know what you're doing eventually before you turn that manuscript so anyway you know. I think we lost audio for just a moment are you still with me yeah yeah you you pause i mean i'm not sure how much you got of that oh i heard everything down oh, to okay. it just helps that you're uh, needing to plan out in advance to help future you out and uh, not write yeah. yourself into a corner yep <laughs> Although I do find, uh, and it could be just because of my way of looking at the world, is uh, hopelessly optimistic. Everything is magical in my mind. Um, but uh, I do find, uh, now that I'm coming up on the uh, finishing the third Banneker Bones adventure, mm. um, that although I, I had a plan, uh, kind of more, more or less, I didn't do a detailed five-year J.K. Rowling outline. Mm. There are a lot of things I don't do like J.K. Rowling, tragically. Um, uh, always aspiring to. Um, but I would find that there were things in the previous book that just worked perfectly. Like, oh my gosh, look at this present from past me who must have psychically known. <laughs> and well, I know that probably can't be true. Well, you know, there is a, I think there is a sense that, well, I've never done a series before. You're obviously more experienced in that. And, um, and I think mine just might be what's called a duology um, at least that's what where we're at now. Um, we just keep it at two books um, because I have all these other projects I want to do. But um, uh, I, I, I have I, I've known the end of the I've known the trajectory, you know, in many ways of the next book. And originally it was supposed to be three. And then we all decided to make it two. Um, I've always known how it ended. I've always known how it began. Um, I knew major, major uh, sort of movements throughout the book. It's just these little weird details, like, um, like the cats, um, things like that. Um, but you know, they work themselves out. Thank goodness. <laughs> I clarify just a little bit. Cause I, I always like to tease my magical thinking. I okay. also think there's a great deal of, uh, of, uh, necessity being the mother of invention, <laughs> now yeah. that I've written myself to this point, uh, it has to work, so it does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It has to work, and 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 it's and and it um and and then when it works, you're like, oh, of course, that's so logical. That makes so much sense. That's of course you would put those cats in there. That makes so much sense. So so somewhere in my subconscious, I think I knew the answer, and and I just was you know obsessed with these these images and and um. I just, you just have to trust yourself that you're going to figure it out because if you, you know, you will, I, I do. It's just, it's that moment of not knowing and going, oh my God, what was I thinking? I don't know what I'm doing here, <laughs> which 
happens sometimes. I'm trying to think. I can't remember who the author is, um, but I'm going to go ahead and just quote them anyway. You read okay. so much author advice over the years that sometimes you forget the name. So okay. if anybody out there knows, leave it in the comment so everybody can credit this quote directly. Uh, but he said that half of what goes on in an author's mind is none of their business. <laughs> Which I've always <laughs> that is a great. Joke. That is great. The one that st sticks with me right now is, um, and I can't can't quote whoever it was perfectly, but um, uh, you know, when when people when pe when you write a book, when you write a novel, um, you've learned to write that novel. Um, you, you you haven't learned to write novel a no all novels because the next book is completely different, and that is really true. Um, I, you know, after I wrote The Wonderling, I thought, oh, well, the second one is totally going to be so much easier, and it is so much harder. <laughs> so, to make it harder as I go. <laughs> is it? Do you feel that is true? Well, I think part of it is it's um, I use the uh, metaphor of uh, leveling up a video game character because I'm forever 12. Um, but with oh, a video game I'm character, fun. you level up their skills, and then but then the levels get harder that you're playing in. And I think that although you learn from each book and you get a little bit, hopefully, uh, we're, we're getting better, um, you get more ambitious and you want yeah. to do something bigger than the project you did before, at least I do. Yeah, I think that's it. Because the second book, um, in the series is much more complex and there are more characters it's much more complex and there are two instead of a single narrative kind of moving through time there's really two two narratives um hap actually two and a half because um there's one character who is very minor in the first book who who kind of becomes a very evil big character in the third in the second book so um yeah, I, you you raise you raise the bar for yourself, and if you don't do that, shame on you. So yeah, it does get harder. True. Do you are you done with the second book at this point? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> we had a little delay. Yeah, I am. I am. Uh, I am working on the first draft now. I am now officially a year and a half past my deadline. Yeah, I had a little. You know, I I I probably told you that I have a brain injury and I have some cognitive issues from that um, permanent brain injury. And then in 2018, right after my book tour, um, a week before I was about to start in on, on um, the second book, I had another brain injury. So I had to, I kind of, I got really waylaid because I had a lot of uh, cognitive problems and um, and uh, reading and writing problems. And my reading and writing problems are still there. Um, they're just not as bad. So I'm, 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 writing, I'm writing in a slower way than I did before. My, my, um, my ability to sustain my concentration is a lot less. But it's better than it was after my, you know, I got knocked upside the head in January. So, um, Anyway, you know, the, the first book, I really busted my butt and, and did, you know, wrote and illustrate, wrote, wrote it, did, um, you know, rewrote it, rewrote it a couple of times, um, did sketches, did the final illustrations, did all that stuff insanely in a couple of years. And, and now it's like, I've been working two years on the first draft. But I'm going faster now because I'm feeling a lot better. So I'm getting I'm getting close to the end of the first draft. I think that the drawings will go much easier than the first book, though, even though the writing's going slower, just because I'm um my my drawing skills have improved, oddly enough. I've been working at that. Um and and now I sort of have a better I have a better sense of how to work with an art director for a middle grade novel. It's just, it's just, you know, the process is easier for me um, than it was. Well, there you go. Part of it, part of it gets easier. Part of it. Yeah, definitely. So what, uh, what does your writing day look like these days? Um, well, I always read in the morning 
I read during breakfast. First, I late, you know, the last couple of years, I've gotten obsessed with reading the New York Times before I do anything. Um, and and uh, so I get I look or I listen to the news a little bit, but mostly I I read in the morning while I have breakfast, and then I I I basically. If I don't have a walk, a hike, a long walk or hike um, in the morning, that messes up my whole writing day because I write when I walk and I write out loud and sometimes even carry a voice recorder. And so um, I get... So are you kind of walking around having a conversation with yourself? Um, it's not. A, I really get into characters like, like, like animators do where I physically... I mean, if people saw me... like. I, like writing in a cafe with other people around would be impossible because I write out loud. Um, if I'm trying to figure out a character, I physically get into their character. I have to do all the accents. Um, you know, it's a lot like acting and, and um, it's, and it's like music. So I have to hear it. I have to, I, I, I can't write silently. That would be impossible. Um, and, and then so then I, I write my, I write, I, I write above my barn. Sometimes I, I'll go to a, a local library where they have a study room. You can get a study room for a couple hours and people can see me being crazy through the window and getting in little, you know, acting like a giant rat and gesticulating or something, <laughs> rat person. Um, um, but um, so I, you know, on a good day, on a good day, I probably write from, you know, like, maybe 10 to three. Um, but sometimes, sometimes I just don't have the concentration. Um, and just, I don't really write at night unless somewhere, um, like doing a retreat or something. Like I stayed somewhere recently where I was, I was gone for five days and I was able to write a little bit in the evening because I did, I wasn't talking to anyone. If I hear, if I have to process sound and information and you know my husband is around and he's talking to me and you know all the distractions and that just fatigues my brain but so in general I don't write at night but I can draw in the evening so I try to draw in the evening um and Sunday I just do something fun <laughs> and lately that's been canoeing so Oh, wonderful. And I read at night. I read every night. And I, I when I ever am in my car, I tend to listen to I'm I've I, I've been listening to a ton of audiobooks. Um because listening to audiobooks has been easier than reading for me since this last head injury. Oh yeah, no, audiobooks are a lifesaver. Um, especially when I'm uh, doing this and I've got a, you know, if I'm going to sit down and physically read a book, I'm going to read the book of somebody I'm going to talk to about it. Uh, but then that might mean that I don't get to Margaret Atwood's newest uh, for a right. few weeks unless I grab the audio book and then I can right. uh, sneak that one in. Well, the audio, the guy who trans who translated, who, um, who did the audio book, narrated the audio book of the Wonderland is fantastic. And we read together in LA. I invite, he, he's a Brit, but he lives in LA, Simon Vance. He's done just about every Dickens book in the world. Um, he's done over a thousand books. He's so good. I just love him. So if you, if you don't have time to actually sit down and read the book, the audio book is fantastic. Did you uh, get to have a say in who read the book or was it just a happy accident that the perfect reader came along? I definitely had a say, and actually the first person, this is embarrassing, the person who was going to read it was Kate Winslet, because she loved the book. And she's wow. represented by my, my um, movie agent. Um, but the, the company that uh, publishes the audiobook um, decided to not go with Kate Winslet, because she was going to be three weeks in turning in the finished audiobook, because she was shooting a film. And that wasn't good enough for them. So they bagged on her and I just felt terrible. Um, and I was really angry about it. And, um, and then they, I knew I wanted someone from the UK because it's set in, in that kind of world. It's set in a sort of a fake London. And um, I also much prefer um, the UK audiobooks than the American ones because they're so a lot of those people train on the London stage. They're just, I mean, I know there are some good American uh, narrators, but um, 
I just really like the British ones or the, you know, Scottish ones, Irish, whatever, whatever. So um, I gave them a list of, they sent me three people they liked and I didn't like any of them. And then I gave them a list of 10 people and Simon was at the top. I had heard him read. uh, I had read, I mean, I listened to a lot of the books he had, he had narrated and I just thought he was amazing. And um, so he was available and bingo. So he's the voice of the Wonderling. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> it's Simon. <laughs> I adore him. Well, I'm glad everything worked out, but yeah. my God, I, I would have waited a couple of weeks if it were me. <laughs> right? As they say in Hollywood all the time, right? They're always saying, right? Yeah, um, that was a little foolish, I think. But, you know, what can you do? Well, is there a chance that uh, Kate might be able to make an appearance in the film? Uh, uh, I know that, well, she was in, she won an, a cat. Yeah, she won an Academy for the, the um, for the role she did. She played in uh, The Reader and this, and Stephen Dalder was the, my director is the same, is directed her in that. So um, I have no idea. I just, um, I never met her. This was all done through, you know agent channels and you know whatever <laughs> but um I do know that she really loved the book and wanted to do it so that was really I had heard her I had heard her do Matilda by Raul Dahl have you ever listened to the audiobook of that I haven't I've read it four oh. or five times I've never oh listened my to God. it it is so good Rob it's just she is every character to a T So she's so good. So when I heard that, I was like, oh, my God, she has to do my. Oh, I I see a little. (laughs) I am so jealous. You have a cat. My sister's allergic and I can't have cats. And I just love cats. I love my cat, too. But she she knows she has to stay over there during podcast time. (laughs) I'm going to pet her and cuddle with her. Well, I'm definitely going to ask you some more questions about the movie because okay. that's that's the dream, right? Uh, as you 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 get your book published, it, it's a big deal. You get the movie deal. Everything, all the stars have aligned. Everything is coming up, Mira, right? And then things change. No, that jinxes it. I'm saying everything <laughs> is always going to be good for you forever. Okay, good. I hope so. <laughs> as Sher- Sherman Alexi said once. Uh, he was in line at Subway with a, a uh, he was doing a something at a, um, some graduate program at a university, and he was in line with his sort of student handler, and she said, "What's it like being, you know, a famous writer?" And blah blah blah. He said, "Well, one day you're walking down the red carpet at the Oscars, and the next you're walking, you're in line at Subway, and that's kind of what it's, it's that's." That's sort of how it is, but not that I'm famous like Sherman Alexi, but anyway, whatever you want to know, the movie is in flux right now. That's why I'm a little circumspect because uh, Disney bought Fox Studios. I don't know if you were aware of this big merger and my team at at, uh, Fox 2000, which I just love this group of, uh, it's an all women it's the only all women um, major studio team in Hollywood. Um, they were told by Disney that they could come and they would have their own division and and so on at um, Disney once they signed the deal. And so Fox Studios signed the deal and boom, all thousands of people lost their jobs. And my team, they said, sorry, we're not going to bring you on board. Oh, and by the way, we own all your movies now. And all the movies in development. So um, my whole team is now at Sony, um, the studio. Disney owns my script. My director is still on board. The production company, Working Title Films in the UK, is still on board. But um, we're just not sure what's happening because, you know, I just don't know um, what was. The deal was that my, my uh, and we have a script, we have a great screenwriter. Um, the deal was that um, prop, my, the Wonderling was going to be the next film that Stephen Daldry did um, after he directed, um, after Wicked came out, the, the movie version of the play, um, because that's his next big movie. 
But right now, we're kind of all in limbo. I don't know if Sony is going to try to buy my movie back from Disney, if um, Disney's never going to make it, if but they probably will they probably still are interested because Daldry's so such a big deal right now as a director um or if they'll make it just for streaming or if they will just sit on it for a long I mean somebody has to make it legally by I think 2022 or 23 because then the rights go back to me so I'm we're all kind of sitting here waiting um I actually just sent um an email out to all the movie people just saying do you guys know what's going on? <laughs> so that's where we're at. Um, I've had up until now, I've just up until the merger, I've had just an incredible, incredible experience. I mean, um, this team of women I was working with, I just love them. I've been involved the whole time with both the production company and the studio and um, sent them concept drawings, um, you know, gave them notes on script. Um, uh, it's just been a really great experience. I didn't, I have not had the awful Hollywood experience that other people have had. Now I'm kind of having, (laughs) it's not, it's just, it's just, I'm in the, you know, place of not knowing, but I don't know if you know the story behind the, and if you want to know the, the crazy story behind it. Um, um, so I had written only a quarter of the book. I had no publisher. Um, but my, my agent thought, it was good enough to send out to publishers based on a quarter of the script. I mean, quarter of the book written, um, which is rather- also, or just the quarter of the book. I had done some illustrations and, um, and, and, uh, it was a rather risky thing, but, um, she thought it, you know, she thought it could fly. And so, uh, public interest and the book was going to go to auction which meant several publishers were going to bid on it now an auction for a children's book could be you know you could maybe get still not make that much money because they don't you know unless you're jk rowling or, or somebody or neil gaiman or someone you know even with an auction you might not get a lot of money and it's up uh, and it's spread out over you know three four years um, so I was, you know, like we got some early bids in and, um, and then my agent was at a meeting in LA with a couple movie agents, um, be- for another project and their client who, whose book was being made into a movie. The meeting was over and she had her, my, my agent asked, um, was with her assistant. She asked the, the two movie agents if she could sit there for a minute and, and talk to her assistant. They were just sort of strategizing about my book auction. And, and she had her computer open, her laptop open, and my, the drawing of my character um, that's in the sort of in the middle. And uh, when you turn, it's in the front of, um, part of the, the, the front of the book inside, inside cover. And my illustration was there and the movie agent walked past and asked what what's that and so my age this was on like a wednesday my agent um said oh this is this character for this book blah 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 told her a little bit about it and she and her her associate said could we read this manuscript and my agent said well it's just a quarter of quarter done but i'll ask the author she asked me and i said sure but nothing is going to happen the next day I get a call from my agent saying um, uh, CAA, you know, Creative Artists Agency, they think, they think there's a movie in this and they want to talk to you. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, re- you know, I'm sure they're really busy. They can call me anytime. They're like, she said, no, they really want to talk to you. And I said, well, okay, anytime. She said, no, they want to talk to you now. They're on the phone now. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I had a conference call. So that was on, a, I think, a Thursday. They sent me uh, a, a list of a, a list of people to um, of directors, producers. They said, "We're you know any any additions you want to make here." I was like, "Okay." Actually, I did. I added my favorite animation company called um, Leica. They did Box Trolls. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, was sure. By Box Trolls, Car- Caroline, just love them. They do stop action and and uh, computer-generated 
uh, movies. And they sent out, they sent out my script to a bunch of people on a Friday on Monday, there was a bidding war in Hollywood over it between universal Fox, uh, Scott Rude and the producer, Ron Howard, like it was insane. And I'm just sitting there like, this is insane. This is crazy. The book's not done. I, 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 to this day, I don't understand. I, I think sometimes a buzz is generated and then everyone wants in on the buzz. And I, I just, it's, it's just bizarre. Um, and so by the next night, we had a director, director production company studio, and we had a deal and boom. And then the next week was my auction and my agent called my the publishers and said, by the way, there's a big movie deal. There's a big, um, they didn't just option it. They bought, they, they bought the rights. So think about that when you make your offer. So that's kind of how the book and movie deal came down. And the whole time I always, I just, the whole time I always had this, my publisher in mind because I just love this publisher and everybody told me, you know, they don't have a lot of money. They're never going to be able to give you as much as the other ones. Uh, my agent was, you do whatever you want. You just take your time. And so I went to the Eric Carl picture book museum, which I love, which is, about half an hour from my house. And I went in the bookstore and I, I asked them if I could do a crazy thing. And I pulled out 30 books without looking at who the publishers were of the most beautiful books in the place. And I laid them out all, all on the table and 27 were from Candlewick press, which is my publisher. So I went with them and they ended up offering more than all the other publishers. <laughs> so and I love them. And the book, you asked me about the design. The book is exactly, exactly how I imagined it would look, but even better. It's just the, just the beautiful design. I mean, they Is just... this your uh, artwork throughout on the cover, inside, everywhere? Yeah. Except the, um, the swirly things and the lettering and the design design um, the, on the cover, that's... Um, that's Jacopo Bruno, who is an amazing Italian illustrator and um, and uh, and uh, book designer. So he did the cover, and um, an art director at Candlewick did the did the um, interior. But it looks, I mean, I did sort of a mock up on how I imagined it to look, and it looks just like it, except better. I mean, it, it's it's I can't. I'm 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 gobsmacked about you know like how how close it is to my dream of the book. I think that rarely happens, so I'm really happy. So, so that's got to give you some uh, faith going on. But one, I assume you're talking to me right now on a gold-plated device, jewel encrusted, and your Tesla's parked outside. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Everybody thinks I've got like millions of dollars, which is so crazy because. Um, when you sell them, it took a year to get paid for a little part of the movie deal. The big part of the money comes at when they start shooting. I so whatever so. I got, it's like, I got less than half after taxes. I paid off giant debts. Um, I did buy a car because mine died. I bought up my husband a car because his died. And, um, and then I helped a whole bunch of people. And um, I got to help my, you know, stepdaughters and help my grandson go to preschool. And but now I'm in, I'm in um, deep doo doo financially because I li I've lost two years of income. So I'm kind of I live. Fortunately, I was able to live um, on some of those savings. So that's the subway and and the red carpet flip flop. You know, it's a risky business, um, but someone's got to do it. Well, when uh, you know we're talking about this Disney Fox thing, I am assuming that having been through that experience, where everything came together in such a, 
uh, an unusual way as though the universe just decided this is happening for Mira. We're doing this. Mm. Um, that has got to give you some faith that, hey, powers like that can't be denied just because Disney, by the time they're done merging, uh, the sequel will probably have some stormtroopers in it, some Marvel heroes. <laughs> It'll <laughs> yeah. be a giant crossover. Well, you know, I mean, I've been really, if Disney does it, Disney has done some really good films. I, you know, I just, I, I'm very attached to my team. Um, but, um, you know, I'm sure Disney would do a great job. Um, the one thing that I, that, you know, even if it never gets done, which hopefully it will, um, everybody still believes it will. Um, I have great access and that's been a blessing. I mean, if I have, if I have, a, if I had a, have a movie script in the future, or if I have something, you know, another project i get i have really great access to people who who can can look at those those projects and say um yeah i can get this to some director i can get this to somebody um so that's amazing you know that's something that's worth a lot um and i'm really grateful for that so we'll just see about the movie um it could work out fantastic you know fantastically it could be that by the time book two comes out, the movie finally comes out and they come out the same time. And, and that would be a good thing. So fingers crossed. We'll see. Are you listening universe? Mira needs this. Let's make this I happen. I need this now. <laughs> I know. Does that, um, having illustrated these characters, having lived with them, having created their voices in your head, you're acting out the rules. I mean, you've lived in this world and it shows your, your world building is amazing. Um, does that fill you with any kind of anxiety that eventually there will be a film version and somebody, hopefully your team, but somebody is going to have some kind of input because even if they listen to, they did, you know, they did a Harry Potter which I think the later Harry Potters are about as close to faithful as you can get to a book. Uh, mostly because I suppose Warner Brothers was in a corner and, and could not do it that way. That The fans would have uh, been outraged. Mm -hmm. um, even if they do that, it's still not going to be the thing you personally made. Is there any anxiety about that? Um, my, I remember my very first conversation with the head of Fox, all of Fox Studios, and I said, I told her that I actually ca came out of film because when I was in art school, I mostly did experimental film and multimedia. And I said, I have absolutely no problem um, somebody doing an interpretation, creative interpretation of, of uh, my book. I, I don't care whether it's an adaptation or not because I see a book, a movie's not a book. You know, it's you're condensing you're taking the essence of something you're condensing into, you're designing time in a totally different way. Um, that said, I, I, um, I, it's really important that you get the heart of the story. Um, and when I read the script, the first draft of the script by the um, screenwriter who they hired, and he's a really great guy and he's, he's, um, I really like him. I've met him a couple of times and I think he's a really, really fine writer. Um, I was about 60% there. My main problem with it was that it didn't felt, it didn't feel like it was in, um, it was more of the setting and the, and the, and the feel of it. It did not feel like a kind of steampunky sort of England. Um, it felt really American. It felt more Disney, actually. And um, it, it, and and there were a couple things that I had, like sixty percent I loved, forty percent, um, no, um, I felt like the so in that like and he changed all the he changed some things for the better I think or that would work in an amazing way for for the film. Um, like there's a character in the book, Belisha, who is a giant crow. She's a guard, the guardian of the night crows. And he does something. Like my character doesn't meet her till much later in the book. He does this brilliant thing where he brings her, like she's sort of 
was there at his birth. And you sort of see her throughout the book and then really get to know her. But you, she's much more important sort of in the background. And he does it in such a beautiful way. I can't describe it. So things like that, I love when that happens in a movie. Um, I don't care. It wasn't like that in the book. It's, it's, a, it's a film. Um, but uh, one important thing for me is that my character does go on this kind of, um, you know, this quest on his own. He's, he's alone for part of the, you know, and he, and uh, in, in the, in the, in the script, he's always with, always, always, always with his friends. And um, I think it's, a, I think to me that that's something that bothered me. Like, I feel like he really should spend some time and um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, you know, there are so many drafts and sometimes with, uh, with screenplays, you get, you've got like five different screenwriters. They just, you know, or the, or the screenwriter goes through a million drafts. So I don't know what will end up, how this um, version will end up, but um the cool thing was, you know, because of my involvement, I was able to give really, really detailed notes. Um, so that's a long roundabout way of saying, I don't care if it's an adaptation. I really don't care. Um, uh, people remember the book. We remember the book. People, I know people get, when people say it wasn't, that wasn't at all like the book. And I always say, eh, because it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Um, but if it complete, like if they turn to a beach movie or like, uh, yeah, like, um, <laughs> something, you know, yeah, they could throw us. I love zombies. Throw a zombie in there. That would be cool. <laughs> Put <one of> your <laughs> zombies and put it in, in, uh, in my world. And that would be awesome. But, um, I think it's important that they, they keep the heart of the story and not every, it's sometimes that is so twisted when it comes on screen, it just becomes unrecognizable. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I don't get an anxiety. Just tell people to read the book, right? Pardon me? If it was a bad movie, you just remind people that they can still right. read the book. Right, right. So um, I, I don't have anxiety about it. Um, although now I have a little anxiety just about what's going to happen to, like, have have Arthur and Trinket been thrown under the bus by Hollywood, or are we just in a holding pattern? Or you know, somebody described um, the, the Amelia Grain Amelia Granger, who's sort of a big cheese over at Working Title Films in the UK, described um, uh, putting a movie, making a movie, as building a city on sand, and that's so true because it's constantly shifting. Things are constantly shifting. So, yeah, it's weird. It's a weird, yeah. Well, going back just a little bit, because I'm, I'm going to stop asking you about your anxiety, I promise. <laughs> uh, but I do want to ask, when uh, you've just got a quarter of the book done, plus I assume uh, an outline and some kind of plan that gives the publisher an idea of where you're headed, more or less. Um, and then that happens. You sell it for way more than you thought you were going to be able to. You've already got movie interest. When you come back to your desk, does that uh, power you to write faster with great confidence that this is going to be amazing? Or does that fill you with terror that, oh, my God, the expectations are, are so huge. I don't know how to, how to finish this now. That is a really good question. Um, I think that that... I think that happened more with the second book. Um, the first one, I really, I just really enjoyed writing it. And I, and I had a really good sense of where it was going already. Um, and there was one moment where um, I turned in, I think everybody read, Everybody, um, all the movie people, and my and my and my agent and my editor read a um, not a finished draft, but a a, a pretty developed, um, full, you know, finished manuscript. But not it wasn't you know, it it went through a couple more revisions after that, and I got I got notes back from the movie people with some suggestions and and. I kind of went la 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 la, <laughs> like, <laughs> like you know, 
actually they asked if if they could give us give me some because they already had a movie in mind and in fact they wanted um they kind of wanted to jump the gun and get the movie stuff going based on this small part of a book and i put the kibosh on it because then the movie would accelerate faster than the book. And I knew that was not a good idea. So um, I really put blinders on. Um, but the pr I felt that pressure more with the, I felt that pressure when I started the second book. And that's because I had read the script. And that just messed me up because the script, like I said, was, um, no, I wasn't, you know, there were some really cool things that I wish I had put in my book that were not in my book. And so those were in the back of my mind. And then there are the things that just didn't work for me in the script. And, um, and also there are things in the, in the, in the script that, um, um, and I, you know, of course it's not a final, final script, but, um, when I gave my notes, it was, it was, I was like, Hey, you know, these things need to be kind of go this way because book two this is going to happen so if you do this in the script that really messes that's going to be like you're not going to be able to fix that in in if you know in um if you do a sequel it, it, it's hard to explain but um there are certain things that happen and certain characters that do certain things that are really pivotal i really set things up um so it was more that kind of thing um uh, but yeah, you know, I, I suppose I, I mean, I had also insane time constraint because we were just rushing and rushing and rushing and rushing to try to get this done. Um, because, because partially because it could have fit into the director's schedule and then he ended up taking on, then he ended up signing on to do the crown on Netflix, which became this, you know, monolithic series. Oh. I should definitely back us up just a little bit and ask you because, uh, you know, um, poor writers who are listening to this are going to say, my, my God, Mary Bartik must have a superpower. She came out of nowhere. This wonderling thing happened and the stars aligned. But this was not your first book. You've been writing for quite a while. You've been uh, nominated for a Pushcart Prize at one point and, and several other awards and, and in literary magazines. So when did you start writing originally? Um. I was I was a um, secret writer. My sister's a writer, and my father was a writer. Um, my mother was a musician, and um, but my father was also a painter. And so there was a lot of even though my father wasn't around, they, you know, his we knew what he did, <laughs> and so there was always um, a lot of art and culture around. And so I I wrote. Um, I wrote a lot of poetry when I was young and little fairy tales and essays and little stories. But, um, I, I, I was very secret. It was a secret thing. And it wasn't until I would say when I was about 30, 29, 30, I moved to Italy for a while. I lived in Italy for a while on this farm and uh, no one, I no one spoke English, and I, I, you know, I, 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 so I became fluent in Italian, and I thought in Italian, I dreamed in Italian, and and that really impacted how I, I started writing these very these short, strange, sort of speculative fiction kind of stories, and I, I um, was still making art because that's what I, still painting, drawing, but I was also writing these little stories, and but when I came back to the states. Um, I just, a light bulb went off. I was doing, I did a lot of music. I was work, always working in museums to sort of support my art, art habit because I was a visual artist. I still am. And I worked in museums, um, as a museum educator. And, um, I did these a lot, worked a lot with kids and, um, I would give kids a tour, say of ancient Egyptian art and I would do it all through stories like myths and and myths and 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 folk tales and legends and then I would make an art project with them that related to the the thing I just talked about um and it a light bulb went off one day and I just thought oh I could I should do put a book together I should put a book series together 
because people, teachers, teachers and parents keep asking me for all these ideas and how to do this and how to do that. And, and I'll just put a book series together. So I made up a sample. I didn't know anything when I, I didn't, I asked a, a friend at the time to help me, um, you know, sort of put a sample like dummy book together. Long story short, I, I, I got a publisher. I, I got, um, I, I signed on with Harper Collins and did a th about 30 books and there it was called a, um, the ancient and living culture series. And so it was a little bit of history, a little bit of, um, geography, folk tales, um, and it circled around the symbols of these different cultures that were then, you could pull them out as stencils and made, I invented projects for kids to do. Um, then I did a, another little series on Native Americans um, for really little kids, because um, those, those books were for middle grade. This is when multicultural books kind of became, you know, big on the scene in the early 90s, mid 90s. So, um, yeah, I wrote all these books for kids, but I also was doing, and they were nonfiction, but they were folk tales. There were folk tales in them. And um, meanwhile, I started writing, I don't know what they were. They were for adults. They were sort of essays, but they were also a bit fantastical. Um, uh, and and uh, I was still writing poetry. I was always writing. Um, and then, uh, I don't know. I did a, um, oh, I had a uh, Fulbright in. This is a long story. You know, you should tell your readers, just get my memoir called The Memory Palace. It's all in there. <laughs> <laughs> they get the whole thing. And they get the whole thing. There's a chapter in there about when I lived in the Arctic. I lived in this uh, Sami, you know, Lap um, village um, on this Fulbright. And, and I did a book of folk tales, illustrated folk tales on, from their culture that they published over there. And... Um, and then I can't, I don't know. Then I ended up, I ended up um, deciding to go to graduate school again. I went to, you know, I had gone to graduate school before for painting and film. And then I decided to go apply for um, a graduate degree in writing um, post first brain injury. Because I thought that would help with muscular reading and, and community building because I felt so isolated after, um, you know, being not, you know, it's kind of not, not being around many people for a while because of my um, cognitive issues. So, um, and and th in in that program at U University of Massachusetts in Amherst, you know, I, I I wrote nonfiction, I wrote short stories and poetry, but I came out of there with that me with that memoir, which ended up, you know, doing pretty well. And that was the New York Times bestselling blah 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 you know, won that big award that no one can pronounce, <laughs> the National Book Critics Circle Award. <laughs> I can't, I can't even remember what it is, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I put in my time and I've published other things and, um, but yep. writing those uh, 30 nonfiction books, did that kind of teach you to the routine of sitting down every day, focusing and, and getting in yeah. your writing early? Um, actually, being an artist for years, really, you, I think the thing is you got to be compulsive. I'm compulsive. I, I, I can't not make something. I can't not, um, you know, like last night I was... Um, I didn't have the brain power to write. So, you know, I was like, I'll draw an octopus. And then you know, I was like drawing, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I keep, there's a sketchbook in every, every room. There's a, I have this crazy rogue gallery in my, um, in my bathroom. I have, I have, uh, these post-its and I, I have to, the, the deal is that, um, this is probably gross, but as long as it takes me to pee, Sorry, I will, I have to draw five little characters really fast on these post-its, and they all go up on the wall. And so my my bathroom is just and um, move them around, and um, 
So I'm always doing something. I always have to make something. I have a little comic series that I work on periodically called Phil and Dave, Two Gay Cats in Chicago. <laughs> and they're <laughs> these, these guys who sometimes become cats, sometimes just have cat heads. And they're, it's all done in post-its. So compulsion. And you do a little bit of writing. I remember I read that at one point you were in five different musical groups at the same time and singing in a choir, plus your art, plus your fiction. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. All okay, I didn't right have kids. Jealousy. I had no kids. Um, I'd never had TV except for I think my mother, like once in a while, someone would give us a broken down black and white TV and my mother would watch Johnny Carson and that's it. So I was completely clueless about television. Still don't have a TV, have no high speed. Um, uh, always carried a sketchbook. Um, didn't even have a car drive it until I was 40. So I had a lot, you know, I just, I, I, I think I've just always... Um, I just have to make stuff. Um, the music's been a little problem because I have not had luck returning to that after all these. I've had five brain injuries since 1999. Not good. Um, music has been a little hard. Um, but yeah, I was, I was in a big Baroque choir singing. And then I was in a, a gamelan orchestra. <laughs> Smith College is Gramelin Orchestra for Indo Indonesian Shadow Puppets. And then I was in a, you know, played harp at a trio. And, um, you know, yeah, I just, I was in a little Celtic and medieval music group. And so I've slowly been getting back into music. Um, but I, I think it's going to take um, a lot of focus. Um, it's going to take me having a break from writing and and at least uh like maybe going to in a, a complete a, like an immersion situation i was supposed to go to um celtic music camp last summer and i just couldn't do it um but um that's kind of on my bucket list to to do something like that i do miss it are you uh compulsive in life as well you're mentioning that you've, you've had uh endless stories i'm sure you could share with us from from all the places that you've lived and all the different things that you've done do you just get it in your mind that you want to do a thing and then just go do it pretty much <laughs> that's so awesome <laughs> i mean i mean um i think i've always been that way like i remember <laughs> i re i remember um when i was four i have a really clear memory my mother said to me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, an artist. And she said, anything else? And I said, I said, um, I want to be a disc jockey too. And, be, and the reason is I thought that a disc jockey was someone who rode a horse, um, made music and projected it on the, and, you know, broadcast it on the radio and, and, and at the same time, you could be up on the horse, you could be drawing. So, so that was the deal. Um, so, yeah, I guess I've, I guess I've, um, I mean, it's kind of funny because I do lack a lot of confidence. I would say that I often, like when I re read my stuff, I like, like just recently, I looked at, I was going through the memory palace, my memoir, because, um, uh, someone was someone's going to interview me about that for something and I just I was looking at it, I was like you know this isn't too bad uh, <laughs> so in general but in general when I'm writing I'm like oh my god this is so horrible I can't believe people publish this and and I generally am really hard on myself but because I have the obsessive thing it and I'm really driven it keeps me going. If I had no drive, I would never, I would just be stuck just thinking, oh my God, who, who am I? I'm, I just, who am I to think I could write a book? But I'm so driven that it just sort of supersedes that. Even with all this confirmation that, you yeah. know, I've said nice things about your book, but I'm just a guy on the internet. The National <laughs> Book <Tired>. Circle, <laughs> Critics Book Circle, they gave you the award. 
you you've been a bestseller. You Wonderling has blown up and, and done huge, and still you're you're looking at the empty page with the sense of despair of why am I not a better writer? Well, it's more it's more um I don't it's funny. I don't uh like I know there there's I know that if I'm reading something that I've written out loud and if I'm reading something and of mine and it makes me tear up or it really makes me laugh. I know I've nailed it and I'm satisfied. Um, and it doesn't happen that often. Um, so I, I have to use a barom, you know, someone as a barometer, you know, generally the first person is my husband who is, who's a musician and has an incredible ear. And if I see him just sort of, look choked up about something. I know I, I did a good job. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, I see writers, you know, I, I meet writers. I know writers who have like huge, huge egos and, um, and can go on and on and on about their books and their, what they're writing and, and, and they, or they'll brag about this and that. And, I just, um, I don't know. It's just what I do. I, I always think I can be better. And I always, and I have to say, a cup, some of my favorite, favorite artists slash writers are really, really humble. And I think I aspire to be that way as well. I think it's, if I would, if I would give any advice to, to young writers, I would say always be humble and kind. Because, um, you know, everybody has, you know, it, everybody has something to, to offer and, and don't disparage other people. Be really kind to them and help, help others along the way. And, and, um, and like one of my favorite, one of my favorite um, authors, uh, author illustrators in the world is Sean Tan, who did The Arrival, my favorite book in the world, wordless picture book. And um, I was fortunate enough to, you know, hang out with him, hang out with him a few times in Australia and here. And he is just one of the humblest people I've ever met. And he also says the same kind of thing. Like I look at my illustrations, I can't believe they're so bad. <laughs> you know, like he, he still, he has his standard for himself is so high, you know. And I think that's, um, I think that's part of it. I'm always thinking, oh, you can do so much better. And maybe that has to do with my sister is such a good writer and my father was a writer and I didn't, never considered myself a writer. I still, when people ask me what I do, I just say, um, I'm, I'm an artist who writes generally, <laughs> <laughs> or I'm a cultural worker. I don't know what to say. What are you going to do when Disney does the crossover with the Wonderling and Star Wars and Marvel characters and everybody in the world knows who you are? You can't walk places uh -huh. without people running up and saying you're amazing. How are you going to deal with all that? I, I'm, I, I'm going to call you up, Rob. I'm going to borrow your cat. I'm going to hold the cat in front of my face. Um, it, could be, it could be just an introvert thing. You know, I just don't know. Um, I was dreadfully shy as a kid. When people meet me, they don't think I'm, I'm um, shy. Well, actually, if I don't know, if I don't know any, anyone in a room, generally I don't talk to anyone. If I know one person, I'm obnoxious. <laughs> so I guess that's the inter, if that's the sociable introvert part of me. Um, so I don't know how I would deal with it. I actually, when I, when I won the NBCC award, there was this big ceremony at the new school in New York, totally didn't expect to win. I was up against like super famous writers and, um, and my, uh, my editor said, you know, did you write something down? I said, write what? He said, well, you might win. I go, I'm not going to win. And so I got up there and, and so I wrote like hastily a list of people 
Oh, oh yeah, the face on you just paused. Are you, can you hear me? No, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, oh, there we go. Um, the I um so I I I put this little list of of um, people to thank on my on a piece of paper, stuck it in my boot. And then they called my name and I got up there and, and I just was, I had I didn't have no idea what to say. I just said, I said, whoa, uh, thanks for, I said something like the first book I did was an edition of 10 because it was a hand printed etching, you know, whatever. I said, I just never thought I'd have more than 10 books printed. Um, Thanks for inviting me to the party. <laughs> I just like I, just, <laughs> I was really I that was utterly charming. It was very embarrassing, and then I forgot to I forgot to I forgot to thank some really important people. But there you go. That's less charming. <laughs> I'm sure you less made it up to them after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm sure that that um, extreme um, distrust of your own brilliance has the upside. You mentioned you did multiple revisions for the Wonderland, and I'm assuming you do multiple revisions for everything. Yeah. When do you, when are you able to let go and say, I've done what I can. This is a thing that I, I'm done with. Um, I can't remember what author said this, but they said that, that you're done with your final draft after the book has been out a couple of years and you're standing up at the podium and you're winning the national book award and you're, you're about to, read a snippet and then thank, thank everyone. And you look down at your manuscript and you go, Oh, why did I say that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, when are you done? I think. I don't know. I think that, uh, deadlines really help. Um, and, uh, um, and sometimes you think you're done and you're not. Like for the Memory Palace, I was about to send, I thought it was ready to send out. My agent thought it was ready and she was going to send out, send it out. And I had a friend who's a filmmaker read it. And he said, this is great. Um, and I'm sure when you get a book deal and you have an editor, they'll, they'll um, be able to uh, fix this one problem. And he mentioned something. I go, oh, my God, you're right. Uh, stop the presses. Like I, I called my agent. I said, don't send it out. It, it can't go out. I have to write these, these two other chapters. And then I did. And he was absolutely right. But I was completely clueless. Um, so um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like uh, I, I feel I feel very complete about this first book and and I feel very complete about the memory palace um I don't know if I would have written that book now just because I'm a different person you know I'm different now but um uh if if you're st if you read through it and you're just not totally sick of it and um and you get I think sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees and you have to really, you know, that's why it's important to have, um, you know, have a community, you know, have other people you really trust read, read your work and, um, and have a really great editor. And my agents are really great editors. So I think um, I also rely on, the, on those people to say, listen, you're done. Stop. <laughs> you know, what about you, Rob? Oh, I've got uh, critique partners that uh, um, drive me up the wall sometimes, but they're almost always right. Because um, I, I always walk in with a bit of that writer ego. Ah, I've done it this time. You're not going to have anything to say. And then they're like, oh, we have this to say, this to say, this. Ah, discordia, <laughs> despair. <laughs> why, why, why is it not what I thought it was? Uh, and then I've got uh, an editor that I trust. And then I've also got um, a couple of family members that I use and some beta readers. Do you use uh, beta readers, critique partners, anybody outside of your, who, oh, yeah. who all gets to read your book before it goes? Well, this, this one, this is really odd because the book I'm working on, the second book, no one, this is the first time in my life that no one's read anything except I read the first chapter to um, 
uh, my sister and a couple friends and my husband. And that is it. I've been working on this for, uh, you know, a year and a half, well over a year and a half, and no one's read anything that's really unusual. Um, uh, before then, I mean, I had a writer's group, which I, I disbanded this year just because I just, because of my, I can't read as much and I just can't read other people's manuscripts right now. So I had to take a break. Um, I have a, a couple friends who are my absolute beta readers. They're just so good. Um, one of them is so busy right now with his own novel and I, I'm, I don't really want to bother him, but I probably will at least ask at some point when I have a really good first draft. Um, uh, and then, I mean, I, I give my, I, I give my books, my, my work to when I really feel like it's at a good place. Um, I give it to a couple of writers I trust. I give it to my husband. I give it to my agent and I give it to a couple a handful of people who are just who are people who love books but are not who are would be the general public you know like I have a friend who um she's a really good reader uh she's a, she's a retired fourth grade teacher um and she's Perfect. yeah and so and so she was also really good for the mem memory pals too because she just devours books with with the wonderling I gave it to children too and I gave it to kids with a, um, an age range. And that was fantastic because a couple, it became clear that I had to change the ending to my book based on ev what everyone said, including my teacher friend. And, and um, you know, in a book for adults, you can leave certain things hanging. You can, you can have a sense of the end of, the end of your book is going to be really dark and full of despair for, you know, like the, the certain characters will never be saved, blah, 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 whatever. Someone might die, blah, blah, blah. Um, kids, middle grade kids and younger, they want things. They want to know that certain characters are going to be okay. And, and that was a big lesson. And every single kid who read my book said is, is uh, Arthur going to go and blah, 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 blah. I can't tell you what it is because then that's the end of the story. And I was like, no, actually. And they said, really? But what happens to blah, blah, blah? And I said, okay, I better look at this. So I changed the ending of my book. I didn't change. I, I changed the location of, of the ending. Um. I don't go into detail because it's a huge spoiler, but, um, and I also had like this one girl was amazing. She was like, what you have here is your aha moment. <laughs> she would like say things <laughs> like that. <laughs> she was just, I love this kid. I, I still, I still am in touch with her and she's, I will totally give her my, you know, book too. She's amazing. In fact, when I did a local reading, I invited her to read the opening to my book. I always, I love reading with people. I, I don't like, you know, um, doing the solo thing. I always invite people to do stuff with me. Um, so yeah, having readers is really important. Um, I know writers who write in a vacuum and nobody, and they just, they don't get feedback from anyone. And I don't think that's good. You just have to choose the people, the right people, you know, as you know, and not people who just, love everything you do because it's so amazing you know just people with really who really want to make that book the best it can be you know so as long as it's coming from a loving place because i've been in a few different yeah. critique groups before i found my beloved young adult cannibals that regular steamed audience knows i never shut up about um, <laughs> they're, they're an amazing group of writers wow. uh, but i've been in the group where you know everybody's nice and they're real polite to you and there's a kind of cynicism there because it implies, well, you're not really going to make this into anything anyway. So let me say the thing that will allow us to get through lunch and continue to be friends. And I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the other extreme of that where the writers are so focused on, on being hypercritical that mm -hmm. you can't necessarily trust what they're getting at. And if everything you're getting is negative, either you're terrible and you need to stop writing 
or you're maybe in a group that's not having a positive influence on your mental space. Right. Well, when I went to grad school, uh, AU Mass, um, my very first group of, my very first workshop, people in that workshop, I am friends with, I would say, still friends with three quarters of them. They were an amazing group of writers. And my, my best reader of all time um, is, is, was in that group. And um, we actually were collaborating on something and then my novel and his novel got in the way. But um, uh, you might, I don't know if you looked at my little, my pathetic website, uh, it says work in progress. There's one that is called the Forgotten Island. That's my friend, Jed Berry, um, who is amazing novelist and small press. He runs a small press called Nine Pin Press. He's also a game designer. Um, he's just a brilliant young guy. It's amazing. He's he's probably my best reader. I did my, spend a lot of time on your website, which, by the way, I thought was wonderful. <laughs> I, I enjoyed tooling around there. I thought it was very impressive. But you would think that, wouldn't you? We, we've established that that's kind of your default position on, on your stuff to a certain point. But I'm telling you, I've been to terrible author websites. This was not one. This was great. Um, but that work in progress um, uh, page You've got mm. multiple books listed there, kind of a summary of, of what's to come. So mm. are you extremely comfortable talking about projects even when they're not finished sure. and they're, yeah. they're not something that somebody can, can pick up? No, oh, sure. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got so many things in the queue, buddy. <laughs> Man, I've just like, I'm just biting the, biting the bit. Cause I really, it, that's, I think one of the hardest things is, is, um, with a sequel is that my mind keeps wandering to these other projects I want to do. Um, so I have to really, you know, just focus, but, um, probably the next big pro project will, is this, is this project that I started, um, before the Wonderling called the Echoers. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, but then I thought, <laughs> I it, I thought, oh, it's such a, it's such a, I've never written a novel before, and it's part of it's in graph in graphic novel form, and I have some of the illustrations done, um, sort of like um, what's his name, Brian Selznick's, um, uh, you know, uh, invention of Hugo Cabret and um, Wonderstruck and so on. I, I like that format of having some sections in graphic novel form. Um, so I started that and, and then I just thought I should do some like really short little fluff, you know, like, like a, like a, a, a sample novel. Like I'll call it the wonderling. It'll just be like a tryout little short thing. <laughs> That worked out well, um, but the Echoers I'm really excited about, and I would, and um, that is uh, that is a story set in the Arctic where I lived in northern Norway, um, uh, above the 69th parallel, and and it is partially it's it's partially based on, even though it's fantastic, it is it is uh, a fantasy. It's also uh, set in. Um, it's also based on two real life situations, real life stories, and um, that I've interwoven during um, World War II. And it's about this um, Sami girl who comes from a very traditional uh, family, um, and and uh, she ends up um, meeting a Jewish boy who is in hiding. And she basically, it's basically um, a story about her saving this kid, helping him get across to Sweden. But there's also this other stuff because she is, um, she also has somewhat shamanic powers and um, she doesn't know it. There's a little theme there <laughs> that I seem to, the secret power thing. Um, and uh, it's also about, um, 
it's also about that place that I spent so much time in and, and the sort of myth and folklore, um, you know, material that I soaked up that I weave into the story. Um, and originally I thought of it, thought of it as a, a trilogy and, and now, um, and I had a, you know, I had synopsis, I had all like a synopsis of all three books. And now that I'm like struggling with the second book in this thing, I'm like, no sequels ever. <laughs> Bad. Bad sequels. Evil. And the other I've thing been is there. It's kind of like being in a in a long marriage. Um, not that I'd know because my marriage is, is wonderful. God bless Mrs. Ken. But how I imagine if you went and were in a marriage that, that started to go bad. Uh, and you start to look around like, look at all these other people that are kind of interesting to me. But I guess I put a lot of time into this. And then hopefully you get to that phase where you're like, oh, nope, I love it again. I just had to do some yeah. work and the book had to do some work. And now and now we couldn't be happier together. Well, do you have any, do you have any advice um, for doing sequels, for working on a series? Um, like what works for you? Well, with uh, I've only done um, well uh, in the case of Banneker Bones, which is what I'm working on now. Um, I picked well at the start. It's about um, I, I used to call it middle grade Batman. Um, Batman's my favorite character in all of uh, in all of fiction, um, and it's something that uh, I call it the and then story because I don't have a definitive ending. I'm coming up on the ending of the trilogy that could be an ending forever. But there's also in the back of my mind, I'm leaving room for four, five, and six. And so this was going to be my James Bond character where there's always going to be another villain that comes along. There's always going to be room for more story. And there's always going to be room for another emotional arc. Because the nice thing about middle grade characters, um, if you're doing an adult, a uh, person like James Bond, for example, uh, has had the emotional arc a few times now. Of, I'm completely in love. Oh, no, she's dead just before right. the sequel. Or, oh, no, she dies at the beginning right. of the next one. And there comes a certain point of diminishing returns with that. We're mm -hmm. like, hey, at this point, James, you're just not going to find love. I don't believe it anymore. I always, because uh, I'm, I'm old, I think of the Friends TV show. By the time they finally ended that and Ross and Rachel got together for the final time, like, I've had my hands crossed. Like, no, that yeah. is not going to work. Yeah. Give it a they couple need, weeks. Both need therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas with middle grade characters, because childhood is a constant series of uh, arcs and learning experiences and growing and developing. I think that I'm biased because I'm the middle grade ninja guy, but I think that that does allow itself for sequels and for continued character growth in a way that stories about adults maybe doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think the hardest thing for me has been, you know, in, in book, the first book, this character, my main character is really shy and stutters and, He's got, um, you know, social anxiety disorder. If you want to you know, give give him a, you know, a diagnosis, and 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 um, he, you know, he really is is sad but content to live in his very very small world until he meets this friend who really expands it, and he has to be brave, and he has to. So he really grows in the first book. In the second book, he's kind of there. So where does he go? inside in, you know inside himself that's been the biggest challenge i don't know if you've encountered that um i've been trying to find find what that point of entry is so that he can he can grow like what um i mean i think i think i think i have it i think he's just gotten kind of comfortable in his life because now he has a better life and he really doesn't want another adventure but he's forced to um, but that might not be enough. I don't know. I suppose I'll see. But um, yeah, that's that's. I think that's the main. Uh, that's my main conundrum with with working on a series is where how, how does that your main character grow? Um, so anyway, um, what's I gonna say? I can't remember. Ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to toss one other, uh, one other tip out there for a sequel uh, is if you have uh, ideally uh, achieved some sort of 
um, happy ending almost for your character or happy ending at cost, whatever, wherever you're at. Uh, one of the first things you could do with a sequel is blow up their life in some way, uh, kill somebody important to them, take part of the town away, take something from them, hurt them badly. Uh, one of my favorite examples is a slight spoiler, I guess, for a book that's very old. In the second book of Stephen King's The Dark Tower, our character is Roland Duchesne, an amazing gunslinger. And in chapter one, chapter two, he's passed out on a beach and a mutant crab walks up and bites off his uh, index finger and his two of his fingers <laughs> that he needs to fire his gun. So now he's only got his left hand uh, to continue being a gunslinger. He's lost his right hand. Like, oh, that's how you do a sequel. <laughs> and Roland is, is, is fascinating again. That Actually, that's, I just had an idea today that sort of fits that, you know, um, like, man, something really bad has to happen to him. He had a really had hard time in book one. We're going to really up the ante in book two. <laughs> so. You've got to do it. you got to keep the character compelling. If you love him, you'll hurt him to make sure he's in the most interesting story he possibly can be. <laughs> This kid, this kid came up to me once. Um, m- m- the m- the response from kids has been fantastic, and I get, I get the sweetest letters from around the world, and I write every one back, even if it takes me a while. Um, but this one kid comes up to me, and he says, he says, I just want you to know, I don't, I didn't like your book, and I said, <laughs> and I said, oh why? And he goes, he said, he said, no one died. And, 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 and I, and I, I hated, I, there was one character I really hated. I said, let me guess. It's the little bird named Trinket. He goes, oh yes, I hated her so much. She's so cheerful. And I said, I said, was there any character you liked? He said, yes, Miss Carbuncle. She was okay because she's a villain. And he said, I won't read your second book unless someone gets killed or, 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 um, and, and, and there's more evil. And I go, well, there's a lot of evil in the second book, but I got to say that, you know, um, I just have a hard time killing a bunch of people off, which is something I asked my, you know, I, you, I, you asked me in uh, uh, our correspondence about something about a grade level, writing for a certain grade level or something. I can't oh, remember. Sure. I just wanted to ask you about how you, um, change your prose from your adult writing to your children's writing, especially with uh, something like The Wonderling, where you are um, uh, trying to invoke a Dickensian feel, uh, which is sometimes a little bit above um, mm. above the grade level. So how are you making concessions without changing your vision for the story and being true to your prose? Well, this... The thing I was going to mention that sort of relates to that has to do with grade level is there's a character in, it has to do with the way I write, but more the content, is that there is a character in book two that I wanted to kill. And he's a nice character. And I asked my editor, so with middle grade, is it okay if like a really nice guy gets murdered? (laughs) Like he's murdered. And she said, if he really, really needs to be murdered, if there's another way to do it, that would be better. And so I thought about it, and then I came up with an even better thing to happen to him, which totally changed my book. But um, that's that's one of those things about grade level that, like, I, I don't sit down and write for a grade level at all. I, I just started, like, I just started writing this book. Um, however, year 12, I'm 10. And so I I... I think it's it's really natural for me to sort of ten to twelve. Sometimes I'm twelve years old, um, but it's it's that period that fascinates me that pre pre hormonal time where you know you don't care about you know lovey dovey stuff. It's yeah, really it's the last bit of peace you're ever gonna have. Enjoy it, right? Right, <laughs> and it's it's really about like I was not into princess stories. I was not into story as a kid i was not into stories about um uh what happens in the classroom or everyday family stories or family dramas or boy girl whatever i loved adventure stories 
I was obsessed with them. I loved Polar Expedition Exploration Diaries. I loved uh, the the Quest kind of, you know, I I was really so so um pretty much everything I write is like is like that for adults too, even my even the Memory Palace. So um you know, when I was writing The Wonderling, I just just didn't think about language level. I didn't think about anything. And I just wrote it and I just realized real, I just, you know, I really trust my editor to, um, to let me know if something is too advanced and, um, you know, getting my, I have these, you know, I get, so when I get, um, men, um, you know, uh, my manuscript back from my editor, like different versions, there's the, I, my UK editor, and the, the UK publisher is a sister company of the American publisher because there's Candlelick Press and there's Walker Press, which is the UK publisher. So I hear back from two editors and two copy editors and two sets. <laughs> it's like crazy. It's all in hard copy. It's like really old school. Um, and it's like being attacked by a gang. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and and like crazy different colored pencil marks and post-its and everything. Um, but I, I love my editor because I'll have something in there that sounds to me like music and it might be a little less clear, but it sounds beautiful. And to make it more clear would destroy the music of the, of the, of the sentence. And the copy editor will always go for clarity. And my editor who also comes from music she was a music major. She's, you know, we, we both um, sort of have very strong music backgrounds. She, she'll write, no, I agree with Vera. Go for the, um, go for the music. You know, it's, 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 it's like, I, I just listened to an interview with Phil Pullman about something like this. And he, he was talking about how the first time he heard I can't remember what poem by T.S. Eliot it was, but the first time he heard this poem, and he recited part of this poem, it was so beautiful. He said, I didn't know what it meant, but the music of the language created a hunger in me it, that I didn't know I had. And that, that's what I, I want to do with language. That's what I want to do, is I... Is I, I because that happened to me too, as a child, I would read something. I read thing. I read books much more advanced than I, sh you know, I didn't understand a lot of it. You know, I was fifth grade reading, you know, Tolstoy and reading all kinds of advanced books and, 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 but, you know, reading Virginia Woolf at a really young age and reading, you know, a line like, um, from the open window, the voice of the beauty of the world came, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what? You know, I'm just like blown away by this, by this sound. And I don't understand it, but it creeps into your bones and, and, and it creates this hunger. And that, that to me is about, is what a beautiful, beautiful sentence does. And so to go back to the idea of, you know, like some words are more advanced perhaps than a middle grade level um i think i'm gonna ju i just am going to trust my editor on that one um we, we actually didn't change a thing except there were certain words that were obscene in uk speak that i wasn't aware of and so we had to remove those let's get and, risque what kind of words are we talking um what did I call in the beginning of the book? It says before he was called the wonderling, he had many names and I list these names and some of them are, you know, they're bully names, kids, kids, bully, uh, other groundlings bullied him. And one name, one word, I can't remember what it is, but it's, it, it, it means, um, something I can't say on <laughs> <laughs> in public I was completely, and I thought I knew like a lot of British slang because I really, I listened to, like I really listened to um, a lot of uh, uh, British audiobooks. I watch, you know, movies. I I I I pay attention to the different 
dialects. I'm trying to get different dialects, even though I'm not a native speaker. You know, I'm trying to get, um, I can recognize, you know, a Northumbrian accent as opposed to a cock. Opposed to, you know, pretty good with that because it's music to me. Um, but a lot of the words, I just, you know, put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> so, so we had to, we had to, uh, tone down some of those. We also had to, um, it's a balance because, you know, it, even things like, um, every, you know, everyone sat at table. Well, we say the table. So I kind of go for the British version because it's sort of set in that world. So anyway, my, 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 publisher my publisher slash editor is great at that um but what age age group is this book for god who knows i mean i know that seven year old seven year olds have read it and and it's been too advanced for some nine-year-olds uh it depends on their reading level and their comprehension some some uh eight eight nine-year-olds have been scared by it some seven-year-olds are like what's the problem you're scared of this? So they say it's eight to 14. It's a pretty big expand, you know, and then I've got some older readers who I hear from who, um, you know, it really appeals to them. They're 14, 15. So I don't know. Um, but it has that middle grade adventure story thing. So uh, what's been your favorite reader reaction? Well, I I would say the most recent one, <clears throat> which is um, for it's it's interesting. I get I've gotten um, quite a few letters and uh, messages online, as well as handwritten letters from kids on the autism spectrum and parents of kids with um, Aspergers and on the autism spectrum. And I heard from one girl who who is uh has Asperger's and she she just made the most beautiful she's been doing fan art for the Wonderling and it is stunning like it is so good it's it's like she's just incredibly gifted and so I um her mother sent me a picture she drew and I re wrote back and I and then I sent her in the mail a little packet of things and she sent back this thing. It was so beautiful, Rob. It was a, a tiny fox she hand sewed with one ear, a little go good luck charm, and then these beautiful cat paintings. Um, and then a painting of Arthur and Trinket. Um, I just will treasure these. I, so I think what she, and, and one of the reasons she, it's just one of my favorite responses is she said, um, her mother said, that her her daughter has a really hard time at school and um and she feels like she has no friends but she feels like Arthur and Trinket are her friends and um and it made me sad but also it was very touching and i have heard that from quite a few kids with autism that somehow they feel like these characters they know them. They don't feel alone. And I think that's part of the reason why I rewrite books. So you don't feel alone. You know, that's one of the reasons I think I do. It's like, you know, I think about the books that I read as a kid or that are sitting, that still sit on my bed, bed um, my nightstand that I've had for years since childhood that I will go back to and and um, I find them comforting, you know, so. Just that feeling that this author knows what I have felt yeah, it's and empathy. they felt it also. It's empathy, you know, and um, yeah, and it's different than, you know, when I wrote The Memory Palace and I would do these readings and I still get letters from people, I would get sometimes like 60, 100 people in a line. And they come up to me and they're crying and they just said, I, I know that you, I've, I've walked in your shoes and that was my mom or that was my, that's my family story. And it would be very moving, but really also 
exhausting, like emotionally draining. My book signing sometimes would be go on like for hours. I mean, it was like, but with the Wonderling, it's different. It's like, it's like kids. It's not sadness. It, it's like, you make me feel like I'm not alone. There's something it's it's a different feeling. It's it's um not that I disparage, you know, people who have gotten something out of my memoir and 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 feel touched by it in some way. I think that's great. It's just that it's it's um it's a different kind of thing. And it's it's a little more uplifting in a way, you know. So, yeah, I would say hearing from these kids on the autism spectrum has been a really huge and other kids too. I have other kids. In fact, I've met one of my first, uh, I think she was my very first, she wrote my very first fan letter. I met her. I'm, um, when I was in LA last year, I've been in touch with her, her and her mom. And I, I just contacted them out of the blue. I said, do you want to have lunch? <laughs> so, she, <laughs> so we got to meet, she was so nervous, but, um, it was, she was, she's, she's, a really great kid, really smart, really sweet. Anyway, well, at the risk of using one of those words that's too risque for a, a middle grade podcast, have you been seduced uh, by the uh, by by writing for children, or do you foresee a time when you might go back and and maybe not write another memoir uh, unless uh, a sequel's worth of really interesting things have happened to you since <laughs> that are that are going to make for a wonderful second memoir. Um, do you see yourself going back to, or do you plan oh. that far in advance? I mean, I know you, you've got the multiple projects listed on your website. Um, well, I have, so I have a book of short stories for adults that's um, also illustrated, oddly enough. Um, and I've got a bunch of stories that I've never sent out. Um, I've had a couple published, but in literary, literary journals. So I have a book of short stories that I'd really like to finish. It's called um, Pilgrims and Penitents. And um so that's for adults. I've got a book of poetry that I have yet to finish. That's for adults. Um, I've got, I have, I didn't think I'd ever write another nonfiction book again, but I have a really cool idea that's kind of a, it would involve a road trip and a possible podcast and a, and a, and a, it's, it's a, it's a fun sort of, um, it's a really fun nonfiction idea that, I might pursue at some point. Um, uh, but you know, the thing that I would love, I would love to conquer the most <laughs> is something that I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. And I, it's the hardest thing in the world and it makes the least amount of money. So I'd have to have a time when I could actually take a year and work on something and not, and not have a bunch of other deadlines. I really want to do a picture book and I want to draw it. And I have about five things five projects that I've, I've started, but I just need time to focus and really work on. And, um, I think, I think doing picture books is the hardest thing of all because it's so, it's so minimalist and it, and you have to really, really tell the, have the pictures, the images drive the story. And, and, um, so that, I don't know. I have this memory when I was five years old and we were all told to go into the gymnasium where the big stage was in our little school. And I sat cross-legged on the floor with all the other kids and on stage, this, this author illustrator, he came on stage, he set up a big easel. He had this huge um, pad of paper and he started telling a story and drawing these animals and told the story and drew and you know and flipped back each page and I sat there and I looked I looked at him and I thought I want to do that someday so I'm still waiting for that moment when I can actually focus on that so um I'm yeah. still hoping you're going to get a horse and some music and an art pad and be that disc jockey that you wanted to be I know I actually <laughs> my husband and I started a a venture called North of Radio, and this is before the podcast craze. And um, I wrote a bunch, wrote a bu wrote an ep, and I wrote and recorded quite a few episodes. And we've actually, 
um, he does sound design and composes and he's a drummer. And, and so we've actually put a couple things together, but then it's so time consuming. The, the, you know, they're just us out there and you really, as you know, you kind of have to keep up with it and do it on a regular basis. You can't just go, um, oops, you can't just go like, maybe I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll um, broadcast my thing today and then not do anything for another year. I mean, it, you sort of have to do it on a regular basis and, and, um, and it's incredibly hard work. I know that you work really hard at this. I am, I am so, um, I don't know if that's, I don't know. That's something that's definitely for adults and I don't know if we'll end up doing that or I'll turn those little stories into some other nonfiction thing. I don't know. Um, Part of what I decide to do sometimes has to do with my conversation with a conversation with my agent. And it also depends on where I am financially. So there's that. Um, I mean, I did write, I wrote a whole other nonfiction book uh, after the memory palace, because I knew I could get a good deal with my, my with Simon and Schuster. I wrote this 400 page book. Um, I liked the idea. I was so bored with the writing. I had no desire to write more about myself. And I kept the editor there wanted me to put more of myself in it, in this idea that I had. Um, and I just, I just sent that to my agent and I sent her um, little snippets of my, my fiction. The book was called The Book of Wonder. And it was uh, about the history of wonder. Um, in the age of extinction, it's a great idea. But um, my agent left a message saying, "I get it now. You've been trying to write about wonder when this is when your fiction is wonder. You should do whatever you want to do." And so that's part of how we decide things. Like whatever I I feel like I need to write at that moment um, that that sort of keeps me up at night. If something doesn't keep me up at night. You know, if I'm not constantly thinking about it, then it's just not, I'm just not going to be passionate about it. So, Makes sense. so we'll see, but I definitely, you know, I'm getting a little tired, so I'm kind of blabbing too long, <laughs> but, um, um, no, 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 you, you had asked me uh, to keep this to around an hour and I have selfishly, uh, let us run well, almost okay. two now. So we should probably oh. think about uh, wrapping it up. Um, how about two, two more questions or so? Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, because I, I always want to, to end this when we're still having fun, uh, sort of like leave them laughing. Uh, don't get to the point where it just got kissed that sad third hour. We're like, so what's in the news? <laughs> we don't want to do that. No, let's not talk about the news. No. One question I have to ask you, uh, because if I don't, all the other authors that are have been on here will say, well, why didn't they ask Mira Bartok that question? I had to answer it. So Mira Bartok, have you ever seen a flying saucer and do you believe in them? Oh, okay. Um, I have never seen a flying saucer, but I have, I know a couple of people who have seen some really unusual things. Um, in fact, I was at a dinner party once. This was amazing. I was talking with, we were just talking about, randomly talking about UFOs. And somebody said, well, I was in, I think they were in New Jersey or something. They saw this phenomenon and somebody at the table who didn't even know that person said, Oh my God, I was there at the same time. And they started describing it. And, um, so I, I have never seen anything, but, um, I, um, I've sort of fouled that a little bit that, um, you know, those strange things that they, that those different, those, um, uh, pilots saw, do you know what I'm talking about? There was like a Norwegian pilot and there was a, um, I think a Swiss, like different pilots saw the same phenomenon. Um, all these lights that look like very fast UFOs going in formation, they all saw them and they called them in. And um, this happened maybe two years ago. So I, I totally think UFOs could exist. And I just, I don't see why they wouldn't. Um, I just haven't seen any. Um, but I think it's to think that we're the only 
sentient beings in the universe that's kind of arrogant. That's just my opinion. Nope, that's mankind's take. We are not only the only ones, we're the best. This is as good as it gets, baby. <laughs> I think we're really I think we're just like a really tiny little speck in a giant universe. And I just think there's so much um so I don't know. I don't I don't um I don't have any like emotional feelings about aliens. <laughs> like I'm scared of them or I love them or uh I just I don't I just think that it's highly possible. And I think there's a lot we don't know and understand about consciousness. And there's just, we know such a small amount of what ha what's out there that I think anything's possible. Um, so that's my take on it. I 100% agree. I think that uh, when people dismiss it, all I can hear is the same confidence with which people must have said, the earth is flat. We all know this. Right. <laughs> why why would you think otherwise okay last question uh, as okay. promised uh and this is my catch-all for all the things that i should have asked but didn't think to <laughs> um is if there was one bit of advice you could go back and give yourself or that you want all the writers listening to to hear mm -hmm. that would have made a significant difference for you would have made things easier what advice would you give them and yourself I feel like the advice I would give is not for writing, but is in general, um, because I feel like the way I've approached writing is the way I wish I had approached visual art. Um, when I was, when I was, um, let's put it this way, I missed my foundation. I, I, I didn't get my, I didn't get the figure drawing, the rigorous uh, drawing, the perspective, the, all those things that you learn when you do a foundation draw, um, program. Uh, and then I went, to, I went to a very experimental art school. And, and um, my one, one bit of advice is that learn the foundation of something, like in terms of, in terms of writing, read, read the classics, you know, learn, you know, you learn so much by reading, re re learn your craft and learn it well so you can break the rules because, and that was my problem with, with art. I'm paying for it now because my ideas far exceed my technical ability to execute them. And I see this with a cup you know, some young musicians I know who, their whole thing is they want to sound lo-fi and they don't want to sound, they don't really want to learn their instrument that well because it sounds like they're too produced. Well, I'll tell you, 10, 20, 30 years from now, you're going to have musical ideas that develop at such a rate and you will not have the ability to, to make them happen. So learn your craft and, and read the classics, but also... Um, What else? That's a real big one for me. Um, I'm really big on being kind. And, and also, also, somebody who's below you on the, on the ladder, pull them up and push them forward. You know, I can't, I can't tell you how many people have said to me, like, why? Like I used to run this blog for f about five years, for, um, you know, sort of helping people with uh, opportunities in the arts, grants, residencies, and so on. I've had people say, why are you helping people with something that you yourself would apply for? And I don't understand that philosophy. Everybody, help everybody shine. It helps you too. And, and those people you were nasty to, on your way up well they might be they might be your editors <laughs> someday or they might be you know they might be the people who are 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 um you know deciding on something big or they might you know i i, I don't know it's just just be 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 kind and be humble and um and also one more thing and this i see in a lot of young writers is this emphasis on 
um, they're like, I'll use one young one woman as an example. I met her at a, I did some kind of, um, you know, stint at a university. Um, you know, I go and read and blah, blah, blah. And the woman is so obsessed with being a writer and she has her, her, um, you know, she's always marketing and promoting herself constantly, 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 and award winning this and award winning that when she's self published one book. And there's nothing wrong with self publishing, but what she spends so much time doing that and, and, and being a personality when is that really you're, you should be focusing on. On, on writing, <laughs> on language, on telling a story, and making yourself invisible, because it has nothing to do with you. It's what it's what your it's it's your story. It's your poem. It's your it's the music. You have to disappear. And when people spend so you know, and that's really hard to tell people who are so obsessed with social media and they're trying to create this perfect life on Instagram and blah 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 and um you know you know when people say you wrote a memoir it's all about you i go no it actually if you write a really good memoir it has nothing to do with you <laughs> it has to do with everybody so i think um and one last bit of advice write to a place of compassion um one one thing i love uh who said this? Annie Dillard, the nature writer, said of this about writing memoir, but we're writing about family. You could apply it to anything. Writing about family is an art, but it doesn't have to be a, mar but it's not a martial art. <laughs> so <laughs> that, those are my little tidbits. Um, I'll probably think of more later, but there you go. Oh, of course. The best ideas always come the moment after we stop recording and then you think of all the things you, you could have, would have said. So oh, when Wonderling oh. 2 comes out, come back and say them all. Okay. <laughs> oh, most importantly, get a pet. Having a pet's really important. Having a little creature. 100% agree. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed that your um, delightful, lovely little cat crept in there earlier and was doing all kinds of lo funny little things. <laughs> kind of went behind the bookshelf <laughs> those of you listening to the podcast that's the kind of entertainment you're missing by not checking us out on I youtube know, really <laughs> you can see special appearances by mabel once in a while i think my wife shows up in the background all kinds of great stuff <laughs> oh we have a character named Ma a new character named mabel oh yeah Mm-hmm. she's not a cat though well not yet but no. now that you've seen the actual maple, I'm assuming. Actually, actually <laughs> hmm, put the seed of an idea in there. So, Where, where uh, can esteemed audience find you online? Where can they stalk you on social media and all that good stuff? Okay, so they could go to my um, my little sad little um, website. The way, reason I keep saying sad little website is because I have this amazing website. Um, but the designer, the person who was the server, he did all kinds of ethical things and a bunch of us unethical things. A bunch of us took our, pulled our, our websites down. So I threw this little blogger site up there. Um, so it's mirabartok.com, M-I-R-A-B-A-R-T-O-K.com. Um, and then I'm on, um, Instagram and I mostly post drawings and, um, and I, that's a recent thing, but I'm enjoying it because I, I follow, um, my favorite domesticated foxes and, um, and I post, you know, I try to post drawings and share drawings with other people. And then I'm on Facebook. I have, um, my personal page. I have a Mira Bartok page. I have a Wonderling page, the Wonderling page, and I have a memory palace page. I have a lot of pages. I'm not on there as often as Instagram though. And I'm on, I was on Twitter. I'm still on Twitter, but not that often. It just got really vitriolic. And, and there's just so many people yelling at each other that I'd rather, um, I'd rather, uh, watch domesticated foxes and cat videos. 
<laughs> on on on, uh, on Instagram, to tell you the truth. So. No, I feel the same way. Whenever I see I have a new follower on Twitter, I kind of pity them. I yeah. look forward to my five tweets a week. <laughs> that's about what you're getting. Well, get. that's more. I mean, I used to I used to be on there all the not all the time, but often. And now I'm I'm on there like once a week. That's it. So same thing. I'm not that I'm on I'm on Facebook more because a lot of my um, foreign um, people from other countries who read the book write me through Facebook. But um, I'm on Instagram a lot more now, even though I don't have many followers. So follow me on Instagram, Mirror Bartok Books, because then it'll look like I'm not such a, you know, sad little person who has only like two followers. I have, one, I have more than two, but I started my Instagram account three weeks ago. It was after Annie Sullivan was on the show because she convinced me that Instagram was going to be amazing, and I'm sure it is. Um, and I have like I don't know how many followers I have, but they're all like people that I know or have met through other sites, mm. uh, and I've done absolutely nothing with it. So I will follow you, and I will I'll watch follow you too. And then I will know how to Instagram better. Well, um, one thing that I tell people, tell young writers, aspiring writers, is put down your phone, put away your phone. And um, however, if you're on your phone, look me up on Instagram. <laughs> um, um, so uh, yeah, I will. F are you under Rob or Robert Kent on Instagram? I think I'm under MG Ninja. Okay. Okay. I'm Jean and Sha. So this it's is how this is how little I care about Instagram. I don't even know my handle to plug it. I know <laughs> to get more followers. Well, mine used to be Mira Bartok seventeen, and then I got some really creepy guys who would be like, you know, thinking I was seventeen years old and started looking me up, and I'm like, no, get rid of that. <laughs> so, so. Ah, creepy dudes ruining the internet everywhere. I know. I'd, I I I want. Um, baby opossums to follow me, domesticated foxes. I just want all these little animals to follow me <laughs> and their owners <laughs> and their humans. So. As always, uh, esteemed audience, find me at middlegradeninja.com. Don't forget to download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees and the Book of David, Chapter 1. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I will see you back here next Saturday when our guest will be. Your guest is as good as mine, but somebody <laughs> amazing. Um, Mira, thank you so much for, for being so very generous with your time. This has been a, a privilege and a pleasure, and I really appreciate you, you making the time to do it. Well, thank you for making the time. It's been fun talking with you. I have been asking our guests to sign us off with uh, our sign-off phrase, which is the totally justifies the name of the show because it's ninja-like. The sign-off phrase is hi-ya and what have you. Will you sign us off? Yes, I will. Hi-ya and what have you.